The Seventh Amendment to the United States Constitution, ratified in 1791 as part of the Bill of Rights, has played a significant role in shaping the American legal system, particularly in the realm of civil litigation. This amendment, which guarantees the right to a jury trial in certain civil cases, has been the subject of numerous Supreme Court decisions that have interpreted its scope, application, and relevance in modern times. The text of the Seventh Amendment states, in suits at common law, where the value in controversy shall exceed $20, the right of trial by jury shall be preserved, and no fact tried by a jury, shall be otherwise re-examined in any court of the United States, than according to the rules of the common law. This seemingly straightforward provision has been the source of considerable debate and interpretation over the years, as the Supreme Court has grappled with its application in an evolving legal landscape. One of the first major questions the Supreme Court had to address was the meaning of common law in the context of the Seventh Amendment. In Parsons v. Bedford 1830, the court determined that common law referred to the common law of England, which had inspired the American legal system. This interpretation was further refined in Dimmock v. Skeed 1935, where the court held that the Seventh Amendment's provisions for civil jury trials were based on English common law as it existed in 1791, the year the amendment was ratified. This historical approach, known as the historical test, has become a cornerstone of Seventh Amendment jurisprudence. The Supreme Court has consistently held that the types of cases that juries decide and the ways that judges can review their verdicts should resemble the practice in English common law courts in 1791. However, the court has also recognized that some departures from 18th century practice are permissible, stating that the amendment preserves the substance of the right, not mere matters of form or procedure. The historical test has had significant implications for the scope of the Seventh Amendment's protections. For instance, it has been used to determine that the amendment does not guarantee trial by jury in cases under maritime law, in lawsuits against the government itself, and for many parts of patent claims. These exclusions are based on the fact that such cases were not typically tried by juries in 18th century England. Another crucial aspect of the Seventh Amendment is its re-examination clause, which states that no fact tried by a jury, shall be otherwise re-examined in any court of the United States, than according to the rules of the common law. This clause has been interpreted by the Supreme Court as a limitation on the power of federal judges to overturn jury verdicts. In Baltimore and Carolina Line, Inc. v. Redmond 1935, the court emphasized that this provision is designed to protect the substantial details of the right to a jury trial, however, the court has also recognized that some review of jury verdicts is necessary to ensure justice. In cases where the evidence is insufficient to support a jury's verdict, judges may order a new trial or enter a judgment notwithstanding the verdict. These practices are considered consistent with the Seventh Amendment because they have historical precedents in common law. One of the most significant aspects of the Seventh Amendment is that, unlike most other provisions of the Bill of Rights, it has never been incorporated to apply to the states. In Minneapolis and St. Louis Railroad Co. v. Baumolis 1916, the Supreme Court explicitly held that states are not required to provide jury trials in civil cases under the 14th Amendment. This decision stands in stark contrast to the court's approach to other constitutional rights, such as the right to a jury trial in criminal cases, which has been incorporated against the states. Despite this lack of incorporation, most states have their own constitutional provisions guaranteeing the right to a civil jury trial. However, the specific scope and application of this right can vary significantly from state to state, leading to a patchwork of civil jury trial rights across the country. The Supreme Court's interpretation of the Seventh Amendment has also had to evolve to address modern legal realities. For instance, the growth of administrative law in the 20th century posed new challenges to the traditional understanding of civil jury trials. 
in Atlas Roofing Co v Occupational Safety and Health Review Commission 1977, the court held that Congress could assign the adjudication of newly created statutory public rights to administrative agencies without violating the Seventh Amendment. This decision has been controversial, with some legal scholars arguing that it undermines the constitutional right to a jury trial. Another area where the Supreme Court has had to adapt its Seventh Amendment jurisprudence is in the context of complex litigation. Some lower courts had developed a complexity exception to the Seventh Amendment, arguing that certain cases were too complex for juries to handle effectively. However, in Ross v. Bernhardt 1970, the Supreme Court rejected this approach, stating that the Seventh Amendment right to a jury trial extends to all suits in which legal rights are to be determined, as opposed to equitable rights. The court has also had to address the issue of jury size in civil cases. While the traditional common law jury consisted of 12 members, in Colgrove v. Batten 1973, the Supreme Court held that a jury of six members in a civil case was consistent with the Seventh Amendment. This decision was based on the court's view that the essential feature of a jury is the interposition between the accused and his accuser of the common-sense judgment of a group of laymen, and that this feature can be preserved with a jury of six. Despite its constitutional status, civil jury trials have become increasingly rare in the United States. Less than 1% of civil cases filed in court are decided by juries. This decline has led to debates about the continued relevance and practicality of the Seventh Amendment. One of the main arguments for limiting jury trials is efficiency. Jury trials can be time-consuming and expensive, and some argue that they are not always the most effective way to resolve disputes, especially in complex cases. However, proponents of the Seventh Amendment argue that the right to a jury trial is a fundamental constitutional protection that should not be sacrificed for the sake of efficiency. They contend that juries serve as an important check on government power and ensure that the legal system remains connected to community values. The Supreme Court has generally been protective of the right to a civil jury trial, even as its practical significance has diminished. In Beacon Theaters v. Westover 1959, the court held that when a case involves both legal and equitable claims, the legal claims must be tried to a jury before the equitable claims are decided by a judge. This decision effectively expanded the scope of the Seventh Amendment by ensuring that parties could not be deprived of their right to a jury trial by the way a case was structured. The court has also been vigilant in protecting the jury's role as the finder of fact. In Gasparini v. Center for Humanities 1996, the court grappled with the tension between the Seventh Amendment and a New York state law that allowed appellate courts to review jury awards for excessiveness. The court ultimately crafted a compromise that allowed for some review of jury awards while still preserving the essential function of the jury. The Seventh Amendment's $20 threshold for jury trials has been the subject of some discussion, though not extensive judicial or scholarly writing. Despite significant inflation since the 18th century, this threshold has never been adjusted. In practice, this means that virtually all civil cases in federal court that meet the jurisdictional requirements could potentially qualify for a jury trial under the Seventh Amendment. The Supreme Court's Seventh Amendment jurisprudence has also had to address the rise of alternative dispute resolution methods, such as arbitration. In cases like Mitsubishi Motors Corp v Solar Plymouth, Inc. 1985, the court has held that agreements to arbitrate statutory claims are enforceable, effectively allowing parties to waive their Seventh Amendment rights through contract. This has led to concerns about the erosion of the civil jury trial right, particularly in the context of consumer and employment contracts. The court has also had to consider how the Seventh Amendment applies in the context of class action lawsuits. In Walmart Stores, Inc. v. Dukes 2011, the court addressed issues related to class certification and the right to a jury trial. While the decision primarily focused on class action requirements under the federal rules of civil procedure, 
it also touched on Seventh Amendment issues, particularly regarding the use of statistical evidence in large-scale employment discrimination cases. Another area where the Supreme Court has had to interpret the Seventh Amendment is in the context of summary judgment. In Celotex Corp v. Catrat 1986, the court held that summary judgment does not violate the Seventh Amendment, even though it allows judges to decide cases without a jury trial. The court reasoned that summary judgment is only appropriate when there is no genuine dispute of material fact, and thus does not infringe on the jury's role as fact finder. The Supreme Court has also had to consider how the Seventh Amendment interacts with other constitutional provisions. For example, in Curtis v. Lather 1974, the court held that the Seventh Amendment applies to actions enforcing statutory rights, specifically in the context of a housing discrimination claim under the Civil Rights Act of 1968. This decision affirmed that the right to a jury trial extends beyond traditional common law causes of action to include modern statutory rights. In recent years, the Supreme Court has continued to grapple with Seventh Amendment issues in the context of modern legal challenges. For instance, in Chauffeurs, Teamsters and Helpers Local No. 391 v. Terry 1990, the court developed a two-part test for determining whether a particular action is one at common law within the meaning of the Seventh Amendment. This test involves first comparing the action to 18th century actions brought in the courts of England prior to the merger of the courts of law and equity, and then examining the remedy sought to determine whether it is legal or equitable in nature. The court has also had to address how the Seventh Amendment applies in the context of international law and foreign judgments. In Animal Science Products, Inc. v. Hebe Welcome Pharmaceutical Co. 2018, while primarily focused on antitrust issues, the court touched on questions related to the treatment of foreign law in U.S. courts and its implications for jury trials. The intersection of the Seventh Amendment and patent law has been another area of focus for the Supreme Court. In Markman v. Westview Instruments, Inc. 1996, the court held that the construction of a patent, including terms of art within its claim, is exclusively within the province of the court, not the jury. This decision has had significant implications for patent litigation, effectively carving out an important aspect of patent cases from the Seventh Amendment's jury trial guarantee. The Supreme Court has also had to consider how the Seventh Amendment applies in the context of remedies. In Toll v. United States 1987, the court held that while the Seventh Amendment guarantees a jury trial to determine liability in a civil penalty action under the Clean Water Act, it does not require a jury to determine the amount of the penalty. This decision highlights the court's nuanced approach to applying the Seventh Amendment, recognizing that not all aspects of a case necessarily fall within its purview. In the realm of punitive damages, the court has had to balance Seventh Amendment considerations with due process concerns. In Cooper Industries, Inc. v. Leatherman Tool Group, Inc. 2001, the court held that appellate courts should apply a de novo standard when reviewing the constitutionality of punitive damage awards. This decision effectively increased judicial oversight of jury awards raising questions about the balance between the Seventh Amendment's protection of jury verdicts and other constitutional considerations. The Supreme Court has also addressed the application of the Seventh Amendment in cases involving equitable relief. In Dairy Queen, Inc. v. Wood 1962, the court held that the right to a jury trial must be preserved in cases where both legal and equitable issues are present. This decision has had significant implications for how courts manage cases involving both types of claims, often requiring them to try the legal issues to a jury before addressing equitable matters. The court's Seventh Amendment jurisprudence has also had to evolve to address changes in civil procedure. In Galloway v. United States 1943, the court upheld the constitutionality of directed verdicts reasoning that such procedures were consistent with common law practice at the time of the Seventh Amendment's adoption. 
This decision illustrates the court's willingness to allow for procedural innovations while still adhering to the historical test. In recent years, the Supreme Court has had to consider how the Seventh Amendment applies in the context of modern statutory schemes. For example, in City of Monterey v. Del Monte Dunes at Monterey, Ltd. 1999, the court held that a jury trial is available for a claim brought under 42 U.S.C. 1983 for a regulatory taking. This decision demonstrates the court's approach to applying the Seventh Amendment to causes of action that did not exist at common law. The court has also had to address how the Seventh Amendment interacts with federal rules and statutes. In Feltner v. Columbia Pictures Television, Inc. 1998, the court held that the Seventh Amendment provides a right to a jury trial on all issues pertinent to an award of statutory damages in copyright infringement actions, despite the fact that the relevant statute appeared to leave the decision to the court. The Supreme Court's Seventh Amendment jurisprudence has also had to contend with the rise of complex, multi-district litigation. In In Re Asbestos Litigation 1991, the court addressed issues related to the consolidation of asbestos cases and its impact on individual jury trial rights. While the court did not directly rule on the Seventh Amendment implications, the case highlighted the challenges of preserving jury trial rights in the context of mass tort litigation. The court has also had to consider how the Seventh Amendment applies in cases involving government entities. In Lehman v. Nakshian 1981, the court held that the Seventh Amendment does not apply to suits against the federal government, as such suits were not recognized at common law. This decision underscores the historical approach the court has taken in interpreting the amendment. In the realm of administrative law, the court has had to balance the efficiency of administrative adjudication with the preservation of jury trial rights. In Grand Financiera, S.A. v. Nordberg 1989, the court held that the Seventh Amendment can apply to certain proceedings in bankruptcy courts, particularly those involving private rights. This decision illustrates the court's ongoing effort to define the boundaries of the Seventh Amendment in the context of modern legal structures. The Supreme Court has also had to address how the Seventh Amendment applies in cases involving multiple parties and claims. In Ross v. Bernhardt 1970, the court held that the right to a jury trial in a shareholder's derivative suit depends on the nature of the underlying claim, not the overall equitable nature of the action. This decision has had significant implications for complex corporate litigation. In recent years, the court has continued to refine its approach to the Seventh Amendment in light of evolving legal practices. In Ortiz v. Fiberboard Corp. 1999, the court considered the Seventh Amendment implications of class action settlements, particularly in the context of limited fund class actions. While the court's decision primarily focused on class action requirements, it also touched on the importance of preserving individual jury trial rights. The court has also had to consider how the Seventh Amendment applies in cases involving statutory penalties. In Toll v. United States 1987, as mentioned earlier, the court distinguished between the right to a jury trial on liability and the determination of the penalty amount. This nuanced approach demonstrates the court's willingness to parse different aspects of a case in applying the Seventh Amendment. The intersection of the Seventh Amendment and federal preemption has been another area of focus for the court. In Wyeth v. Levine 2009, while primarily a case about federal preemption of state law claims, the court's decision had implications for the preservation of jury trials in pharmaceutical liability cases. By rejecting broad federal preemption, the court effectively preserved the role of juries in determining factual issues in these cases. The Supreme Court has also had to address how the Seventh Amendment applies in cases involving equitable defenses to legal claims. In Beacon Theatres, Inc. v. Westover 1959, the court held that when legal and equitable claims are joined in the same action, 
the legal claims must be tried first to a jury. This decision has had significant implications for how courts manage cases involving both legal and equitable issues. In the context of employment law, the court has had to consider how the Seventh Amendment applies to statutory claims. In Chauffeurs, Teamsters and Helpers Local No. 391 v Terry 1990, the court held that employees have a right to a jury trial in suits against their union for breach of the duty of fair representation. This decision illustrates the court's approach to applying the Seventh Amendment to modern statutory causes of action. The court has also had to address how the Seventh Amendment interacts with international treaties. In Daimler AG v Baum in 2014, while primarily focused on personal jurisdiction issues, the court's decision had implications for how international cases are tried in U.S. courts, potentially affecting the application of the Seventh Amendment in transnational litigation. In recent years, the court has continued to grapple with the application of the Seventh Amendment in the context of class actions. In Tyson Foods, Inc. v. Wafeco 2016, the court addressed issues related to the use of statistical evidence in class actions, which has implications for how jury trials are conducted in these complex cases. The Supreme Court's Seventh Amendment jurisprudence has also had to evolve to address changes in technology and their impact on civil litigation. As electronic discovery and digital evidence have become increasingly prevalent, the court has had to consider how these developments affect the role of juries in assessing evidence and determining facts. In the realm of patent law, the court has continued to refine the boundary between judge and jury responsibilities. In Halo Electronics, Inc. v. Pulse Electronics, Inc. 2016, the court addressed the standard for awarding enhanced damages in patent cases, emphasizing the role of district court discretion while still preserving the jury's fact-finding function. This decision highlights the ongoing challenge of balancing the technical aspects of patent law with the constitutional right to a jury trial. The court has also had to consider how the Seventh Amendment applies in cases involving complex financial instruments and transactions. In Merrill Lynch, Pierce, Fenner and Smith Inc. v. Manning 2016, while primarily focused on jurisdictional issues, the court's decision had implications for how securities fraud cases are tried, potentially affecting the scope of jury trials in these complex financial disputes. The intersection of the Seventh Amendment and arbitration agreements has continued to be a significant area of focus for the court. In Epic Systems Corp v. Lewis 2018, the court upheld the enforceability of individual arbitration agreements in employment contracts, effectively limiting employees' ability to bring class action lawsuits. While not directly addressing the Seventh Amendment, this decision has significant implications for the practical availability of jury trials in employment disputes. The court has also had to address how the Seventh Amendment applies in cases involving statutory damages. In Feltner v. Columbia Pictures Television, Inc. 1998, as mentioned earlier, the court held that the Seventh Amendment provides a right to a jury trial on all issues pertinent to an award of statutory damages in copyright infringement actions. This decision has had far-reaching implications for how courts handle statutory damage claims across various areas of law. In the context of civil rights litigation, the court has continued to refine its approach to the Seventh Amendment. In Manuel v. City of Joliet 2017, while primarily focused on the Fourth Amendment, the court's decision had implications for how civil rights claims are tried, potentially affecting the scope of jury trials in these important cases. The court has also had to consider how the Seventh Amendment interacts with other constitutional provisions, particularly in cases involving First Amendment issues. In Snyder v. Phelps 2011, while primarily focused on free speech issues, the court's decision had implications for how juries assess damages in cases involving protected speech. 
The application of the Seventh Amendment in cases involving government entities has continued to be an area of focus for the court. In Nick v. Township of Scott 2019, the court overturned precedent regarding the ripeness of takings claims, potentially expanding the availability of jury trials in cases involving property rights and government action. The court has also had to address how the Seventh Amendment applies in cases involving complex regulatory schemes. In Lou v. SEC 2020, while primarily focused on the SEC's authority to seek disgorgement, the court's decision had implications for how courts determine remedies in securities fraud cases, potentially affecting the role of juries in these proceedings. In recent years, the court has continued to grapple with the application of the Seventh Amendment in the context of class certification. In Comcast Corp v. Barron 2013, the court emphasized the need for rigorous analysis at the class certification stage, which has implications for how courts manage the fact-finding process in complex class actions. The intersection of the Seventh Amendment and issues of personal jurisdiction has also been an area of focus for the court. In Bristol Myers Squibb Co v Superior Court of California 2017, while primarily focused on personal jurisdiction issues, the court's decision had implications for where plaintiffs can bring lawsuits, potentially affecting the composition of jury pools in mass tort cases. The court has also had to consider how the Seventh Amendment applies in cases involving complex scientific evidence. In Daubert v. Merrill Dow Pharmaceuticals, Inc. 1993, while primarily focused on the admissibility of expert testimony, the court's decision had significant implications for how juries assess scientific evidence in civil trials. In the realm of intellectual property law, the court has continued to refine the boundary between judge and jury responsibilities. In TC Heartland LLC v Kraft Foods Group Brands LLC 2017, while primarily focused on venue issues in patent cases, the court's decision had implications for where patent cases are tried potentially affecting the composition of jury pools in these technical disputes. The court has also had to address how the Seventh Amendment applies in cases involving complex financial regulations. In Kokesh v. SEC 2017, while primarily focused on the statute of limitations for disgorgement claims, the court's decision had implications for how courts determine remedies and securities enforcement actions potentially affecting the role of juries in these proceedings. The intersection of the Seventh Amendment and issues of standing has also been an area of focus for the court. In Spoko, Inc. v. Robbins 2016, while primarily focused on Article III standing requirements, the court's decision had implications for when plaintiffs can bring lawsuits, potentially affecting the availability of jury trials in cases involving intangible harms. The court has also had to consider how the Seventh Amendment applies in cases involving complex environmental regulations. In County of Maui v Hawaii Wildlife Fund 2020, while primarily focused on the interpretation of the Clean Water Act, the court's decision had implications for how environmental cases are tried, potentially affecting the role of juries in determining compliance with complex regulatory schemes. In recent years, the court has continued to refine its approach to the Seventh Amendment in light of evolving legal practices. In Cyan, Inc. v. Beaver County Employees Retirement Fund 2018, the court addressed issues related to the jurisdiction of state courts over certain securities class actions, which has implications for where these cases are tried and, consequently, the composition of jury pools. The court has also had to address how the Seventh Amendment applies in cases involving complex international transactions. In Jesner v. Arab Bank, PLC 2018, while primarily focused on the alien tort statute, the court's decision had implications for how international cases are tried in U.S. courts, potentially affecting the application of the Seventh Amendment in transnational litigation. 
The intersection of the Seventh Amendment and issues of sovereign immunity has been another area of focus for the court. In Franchise Tax Board of California v. Hyatt 2019, the court addressed issues related to state sovereign immunity, which has implications for when private parties can bring lawsuits against states and, consequently, the availability of jury trials in these cases. The court has also had to consider how the Seventh Amendment applies in cases involving complex financial instruments. In Lorenzo v. SEC 2019, while primarily focused on the scope of liability for securities fraud, the court's decision had implications for how securities cases are tried, potentially affecting the role of juries in determining liability in these complex financial disputes. In the realm of employment law, the court has continued to refine its approach to the Seventh Amendment. In Fort Bend County v. Davis 2019, while primarily focused on administrative exhaustion requirements, the court's decision had implications for how employment discrimination cases proceed to trial, potentially affecting the availability of jury trials in these important cases. The court has also had to address how the Seventh Amendment applies in cases involving complex statutory schemes. In Obdusky v. McCarthy and Holthus LLP 2019, while primarily focused on the interpretation of the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, the court's decision had implications for how debt collection cases are tried, potentially affecting the role of juries in these proceedings. The intersection of the Seventh Amendment and issues of federal preemption has continued to be an area of focus for the court. In Virginia Uranium, Inc. v. Warren 2019, while primarily focused on the preemptive effect of the Atomic Energy Act, the court's decision had implications for how certain environmental and energy cases are tried, potentially affecting the availability of jury trials in these disputes. The court has also had to consider how the Seventh Amendment applies in cases involving complex regulatory enforcement actions. In Lou v. SEC 2020, as mentioned earlier, the court addressed the SEC's authority to seek disgorgement, which has implications for how courts determine remedies in securities enforcement actions and the potential role of juries in these proceedings. In recent years, the court has continued to grapple with the application of the Seventh Amendment in the context of class arbitration. In Lamps Plus, Inc. v. Varela 2019, the court addressed issues related to the interpretation of arbitration agreements, which has implications for the availability of class actions and, consequently, the practical availability of jury trials in certain types of disputes. The court has also had to address how the Seventh Amendment applies in cases involving complex statutory interpretation. In Bostock v. Clayton County 2020, while primarily focused on the interpretation of Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, the court's decision had implications for how employment discrimination cases are tried, potentially affecting the role of juries in determining liability in these important civil rights cases. The intersection of the Seventh Amendment and issues of personal privacy has been another area of focus for the court. In Frank v. Gauss 2019, while primarily focused on the appropriateness of Cypress settlements in class actions, the court's decision had implications for how privacy-related class actions are resolved, potentially affecting the availability of jury trials in these increasingly common disputes. The court has also had to consider how the Seventh Amendment applies in cases involving complex international trade regulations. In United States v. Arthrex, Inc. 2021, while primarily focused on the Appointments Clause, the court's decision had implications for how certain patent disputes are adjudicated, potentially affecting the role of juries in these technical cases with international implications. In the realm of consumer protection law, the court has continued to refine its approach to the Seventh Amendment. In TransUnion LLC v. Ramirez 2021, the court addressed issues related to standing in the context of a class action under the Fair Credit Reporting Act, 
which has implications for when consumers can bring lawsuits and, consequently, the availability of jury trials in these cases. The court has also had to address how the Seventh Amendment applies in cases involving complex environmental regulations. In County of Maui v Hawaii Wildlife Fund 2020, as mentioned earlier, the court's interpretation of the Clean Water Act had implications for how environmental cases are tried, potentially affecting the role of juries in determining compliance with complex regulatory schemes. The intersection of the Seventh Amendment and issues of religious freedom has been another area of focus for the court. In Our Lady of Guadalupe School v Morisibura 2020, while primarily focused on the ministerial exception to employment discrimination laws, the court's decision had implications for how certain employment disputes involving religious institutions are adjudicated, potentially affecting the availability of jury trials in these cases. In conclusion, the Supreme Court's interpretation and application of the Seventh Amendment continue to evolve as the court grapples with new legal challenges and changing societal norms. From complex financial instruments to international trade disputes, from environmental regulations to privacy concerns, the court's Seventh Amendment jurisprudence touches on a wide range of contemporary legal issues. As the legal landscape continues to change, it is likely that the court will face new challenges in balancing the historical right to a civil jury trial with the practical realities of modern litigation. The ongoing debate over the role of juries in civil cases, the tension between efficiency and constitutional rights, and the challenges posed by increasingly complex legal and factual issues ensure that the Seventh Amendment will remain a vital and contentious area of constitutional law for years to come.